And there's also the case that there just are some parts of the world that are regular enough and general enough that they could be reduced down to one framework. And then there are parts of life that aren't. And that needs to be respected and taken seriously. Well, you reference something which is always assumed in our conversations there called the world. It's, it's a convenient fiction. I mean, the, the, the sense, the, the, what's, what's in, what you mean to pick out with that will vary every time you utter those words. They won't always mean a blue ball in space on a particular date. Uh, they might mean the world of medieval jousting. Or <laughs> In the world of medieval jousting, we can probably find methods to you know, deal with the phenomena that arise in that world and, and treat them with the respect they deserve. But it would be confined to the world of medieval jousting. Um, the world of re the responses of a psychological subject in the cognitive psychologist laboratory, you know, that's a world to the cognitive psychologist laboratory, but it's a world as obviously relevant to cosmology and living as medieval jousting is. <laughs> okay, so maybe, maybe we could start there for the audience. Um, that the the idea of world and subject, you know, understanding the mind or cognition, whatever those things are, uh, as divided into these neat categories of world and subject, um, this has been around with us forever. Um, where's the mistake in thinking about things like that? Right, you went straight for the two most problematic words, world and subject. How'd you pick object, like teapot? We'd be on firmer ground, right? You know what a teapot is, I know what a teapot is, there's a teapot. Turns out, of course, there's a lot to being a teapot. There's a lot more than any representation of a teapot can count or capture. Um, but we're very good at arriving at consensus around objects. We, we come with common bodies and their common conditions to a teapot, and we, 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 we get by, we coordinate just fine with respect to the teapot. Unfortunately, that is, of course, the teapot exists objectively in the sense that we're not going to get into any metaphysical fights about this teapot. There it is. It's a wonderful little teapot. Um, but it leaves that process of stabilizing an objective view, as work in science and technology studies clearly show, is constructive work. It requires us to agree our methods have certain shared presuppositions. It requires a great deal of communion or, or shared ground between us before objectification can work. And then um, a simplistic discourse then presumes that objects are facts, are things, are indisputable, they're just there, and everything else is a pure mystery, so the word subject becomes pure mystery. And the world, as we said, could be taken to mean almost anything in any discourse. In fact, in many respects, the world has taken the place of both nature and God in, in discourse. People try to rein in their cosmological ambitions, so they assume that when I speak of the world, you know what I mean. But if I speak of the world, I mean everything, really. And any attempt to refer to everything fails. I mean, mystics have told us this for a um, long <laughs> Unity, the whole shebang. God or nature, Spinoza. Um, you know. So, subjects. Cognitive science, for me, um, in fact, let, 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 let's play a little game. Everyone loves a bit of physics. We just pointed to a beautiful physics experiment, right? Um, now, in fact, physics is a rather esoteric occupation. And we're extremely skilled at it. And we have wonderful instruments, which we agree uh, produce measurements of a particular kind with a great deal of accuracy and reproducibility. And it, it does try to show us something of the non-negotiable conditions of our being. The gravitational constant is just not up for, you know, take all your postmodernism and the gravitational constant is not going to change. Right. Well, let's pretend that physics was in the business of uh, undergirding our sense of f physical reality, the table I just banged on, things that go bump in the night, the, um, the, the, the reassuring solidity of things. And physics is absolutely not in that game, right? It's not. There's no things in physics. It doesn't describe tables. But we use the word physical to describe this table thumping firm reality. Um, so if physics were in that business of producing, of, of describing teapots, then cognitive science would be in the business of describing subjects, right? And you could 
clear the pitch here and destroy everything and say, I mean, minds, of course, your mind, my mind, right? And no one's, no one, just like physics doesn't deliver teapots, cognitive science doesn't deliver minds. There's no minds in cognitive science. It says mind and thought. These are great, a grand abstracta. So the word subject quickly collapses back to your naive view of, or, or your absolutely justifiable view of who you are in the universe, how you figure in things. Because if I'm talking to you, Asha, you're a subject. <laughs> you can talk to me as if I'm a bundle of atoms, but I guarantee you I'm taking your subjectivity seriously in conversation because one thing a subject is, subjects can be of different kinds. One thing a subject is, is something into which you can enter a relationship. You and I are in a relationship right now. Don't, don't worry. And I'm not going to ghost you. We're going to stay here and have a little conversation. I'm in a much more, I, I, I wouldn't pick out the tree behind you as the thing I'm in a relationship with. I would, I would say it's you I'm in a relationship. And to that extent, this is an intersubjective dialogue. That's fairly simple. There's a distinguished sense of subject, which is something to whom something matters. That's not quite the same. In this sense, the subject is uh, the subject is it can be a bearer of uh, functional predicates. So the heart functions in the body; it's for the body, because we recognize the economy of the body as a distinguished unity. That means because we recognize it as a distinguished unity, things matter to it. So you perturb the body and the internal organization and history of the body and its couplings will determine its response. It's not there just to be poked around. Now, in fact, nothing in the universe can be simply poked in that way. But when we encounter the body, we have this strong and justifiable sense of a subject because things matter to a body. Now, person is a different matter. Mind is a different matter. But those are two important different senses of subject. Neither of them solipsistic. In one case, we talked about the body, but we could have talked about any unity to which, from which, to which we, we would be willing to say things matter to it. And the other one is this relational thing. A subject is something into which you enter a dialogue, a dance, and uh, a relationship. So uh, in my business, I study chanting, as you know. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk a bit about that, but I have a problem, I put it in the title of my book, which is the notion of collective subjects. You see, I'm grimacing, so all you hearers out there, I don't like that term, collective subjects, but I was stuck with it, because as soon as you say subject, people immediately think person, mind, and cognitive system, and bank balance. Mm. So, yeah. Well, you started at the ground floor. You said world and subject, uh, world and subject, yeah. And we said object is easier because we can reach agreement because we have means of coordinating our doings, reaching epistemological satisfaction for present purposes. And there's a teapot. And we don't have a problem with it. I have no more problem with the teapot than with the subject I'm talking to with you. Where we will be careful is that when there's a teapot on the table, we... We said we can't, no representation of the teapot can capture the teapot in its entirety. The teapot has a history. It goes back to clay mines in China, factories, merchants, it got here, presents, and so on. There's the, the, the teapot got here. And no representation, no drawing of it, photograph of it, CAD diagram of it, or 3D scan of it is going to capture all that, obviously. Now, but for our purposes, it's assuming we're reasonably utilitarian. The teapot is there for us to have a cup of tea with, right? We don't get involved in this, and we don't engage with it further. Now, I have, I have no more difficulty in, in, in knowing or accepting or dealing with your reality than I have with the teapots, except that in the case of the teapot, our joint purposes mean our investigation stops somewhere. We've, we, we, we've uncovered, sure, you can go into history of teapots, you can, do, you know, his, teapots of histories. <laughs> you could do a history of teapots. Um, but we're done. Whereas when I'm talking to you, we're never done. The open-endedness is part and parcel of the interaction. Um, I, I will learn from the teapot, 
but it's finite what else. I mean, maybe tomorrow I'll learn something new from the teapot. Maybe the teapot's going to change my life precisely because we had this conversation. But usually it's fairly inert. Whereas talking to you is a live proposition. I have no idea what you're going to say next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're, we're in the world of embodiment and activism. Do you, I won't say do you stand. Where do you, where do you hover in that world? Actually, I'm in it, I suppose. I think it's a poorly defined world. <laughs> uh, there, as we said, there's no single school of embodied cognitive science, and I'm trying to figure out what it means to speak as an embodied cognitive scientist, but it's my bread and butter, so in that respect, I'm in the world. Uh, but, um, so, maybe I ought to say just a little bit about my personal educational sort of how I got here. Uh, so I, I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm Irish. I was born in '62, and I became a nurse after school. So I'm a, I'm a German nurse. I became a nurse in Germany, and then I went back to college because I read a fascinating book by Douglas Hofstadter, Gödel Escherbach, which you may have heard of. Introduced me to the introduced me to the perplexities of recursion and the very notion of cognitive science. Um, so I went looking for something I could do in that line, and the nearest thing we had was a degree in computer science and linguistics. So I combined those two. I was an undergraduate, and then I went off to to, to look for Dr. Hofstadter. I got into Indiana University, where he was, and got into the cognitive science program and did a PhD there in a joint major in linguistics and cognitive science. But I was studying speech. By this stage, I'd become a speech person. I was falling into Phonetics, a wonderful field. Phonetics is a wonderful field. Uh, I didn't think so going into Indiana. I thought, I'm off to do a PhD in linguistics. The only thing I know is I'm not going to do phonetics. And I got there and did phonetics, and it was the best thing in the world. I also took a class with Doug and got to know him, and it was a wonderful interdisciplinary environment. But what was unique to it, and this is the 1990s, was that everyone in cognitive science, the world of cognitive science at that stage, was buzzing with connectionism. Connectionism was a new deal on the block. The PDP books had come out in 1987, and everyone was playing with the software, and graduate students were outstripping their professors because they got software, and they, you know, professors are like your parents. They can't program a VCR, but very clever. The PDP groups distributed software with their books, and all the clever grad students, me included, picked up this software and started playing with it, and the professors went, oh, shit, the kids are getting unruly again. So it was very, very exciting time, but we in Indiana had a different take on things. We were more revolutionary than everyone else because we had identified a different paradigm change. Everyone likes a good paradigm change, a good revolution. Everyone wants, like 4E is just another one of these hype machines. To some extent. Uh, but we had, um, I would say, confusedly tapped into something that will never go away. We had latched on to the most significant development of mathematics in the second half of the 20th century, the development of nonlinear dynamics, the whole of uh, chaos theory, fractals, nonlinear dynamics, far from equilibrium systems. Dynamical systems was our rallying cry. We didn't know what that meant. We were not good at this. But there was the way academics work is there were lots of Productive, sometimes tenuous, sometimes solid connections um, among the disciplines. And that included a lot of people who were on this nonlinear dynamics bandwagon because a lot of the work was still being done there. It was an incredibly productive time. And people were taking these new ideas and thinking with them. They were thinking with them and the thoughts were inchoate and we were not masters of our material, but we knew we couldn't articulate why this was important. Now, in retrospect, there are some facile arguments you can make, and there are some deep arguments you can make. The facile argument is that, you know, there was a reason you were taught calculus in school. It's pretty good for the science shit. It's the natural language of the sciences, which you have anything that varies continuously in time. The way science deals with that is through quantitative modeling using differential equations. Or, indeed, qualitative modeling. Indeed, dynamical models allowed you to capture qualitative and quantitative aspects. It wasn't particularly partisan about those, which is nice. And connections networks, which were so popular, 
Um, they could be looked at as dynamical systems. Once recurrence is involved, they were obviously dynamical systems, and our vocabulary came into use, and so that's, that's where I cut my teeth. Embodiment wasn't much of a rallying cry in the 90s in Indiana. It was connectionism and dynamical systems. Those were the two sort of revolutionary paradigms. Um, I did a PhD in 97. I came back to Ireland after a couple of postdocs in 99. And it's over the next few years, embodiment sort of became the rallying cry um, in various ways. The School of Ecological Psychology and Gibsonian approaches to perception have always trundled along, and we were always very favorably disposed towards them. Jeff Bingham, one of the best ecological psychologists out there, was at Indiana. He taught, taught me, and we had people like Linda Smith and Esther Thielen taking ideas from Gibson and from Scott Kelso's work on task dynamics, coordination dynamics. I don't know if you've ever met that field. Yeah, a little bit. So Scott was the main intellectual force behind my PhD work. Um, that was where I really cut my teeth. And so they were, the, these ideas were combining. And over the years now, <clears throat> embodiment has come out as a, a very central, as, as I suppose, the repositioning required in cognitive science to get away from the fantasies of God, God men, people who think they're gods, and excluded from the natural order and not animals. Um, it wasn't dynamics, although that's going to be useful. It wasn't connectionist networks. They're going to go, have, they have a different future. <laughs> it was the re-attachment to the body. And what I didn't know in the 90s, but I know now, was that the philosophy of biology and its connection to lived experience, to the living body, to, to here, you, me, sitting here, had made a breakthrough with the work of Umberto Maturana. You may have heard of, you've heard of him and his notion of auto, autopoiesis, an invented word. Um, and when I say a breakthrough had been made, I don't want to represent science as a constant progress. That's nonsense. If I try to figure out things from where I'm standing right now, there are certain important points. So Descartes pops up in 1600, and yeah, he's important. I'm going to refer to Descartes. Right? I'm not going to refer to everything in Cartesian scholarship thereafter, but he's a landmark. Now, Maturana's work gave rise to uh, fruitful collaborations with Francisco Varela, which gave rise to later the development of the, the School of Inaction, which has been a big concern of mine since. But I don't think we should confuse the working out of the theories and their developments in various ways, because there's various forms, various flavors of this. The reason I'm pointing to Descartes is the same reason, uh, to Maturana is the same reason I'm pointing to Descartes, because that's a landmark. Autopoiesis is the introduction into cosmology of a self of self-production, of a self-producing being. Um, and it gives you nothing more than that. Everything else is hard work, and the hard work has been done in the school of inaction and has been done using different approaches to epistemology that are not absolutely rotten with um, Christianity and Christian notions, Protestant notions. The infusion of Buddhist epistemology was very important and destabilizing at that time. Um, the work continues. I think Maturana is the point at which we can finally begin to understand Another landmark figure, Charles Darwin. So if we take, uh, we mentioned years are a bit unstable, right? Let's just take about 1850, okay, and move around. Uh, that's around about the time that uh, the theory of natural selection comes available, that evolutionary theory starts being developed, really, that species are seen to be mutable. Species is a word that belongs in biology. Didn't always belong in biology. Species means, as a, as a core meaning, which you'll find in the Bible, which is kind. The animals are always of their kind, and you recognize your kind. It's a very important word that we can come back to. But it became refined in the emerging discipline. Remember, biology itself is only emerging as a discipline. And species then becomes attached, unfortunately, 
to the form of the individual body, which is seen to belong to an essentialized collective. You're a blue whale. Okay, I see you as a blue whale. I can slap your big blue whale back. That's a body. What, what kind of body is it? Well, it belongs to blue whales. Okay, that's an essentialized collective. Where do we find those? Well, if we continue throughout time, if we had continuous access to all of time, we'll never find a border between blue whale and not blue whale, just as we won't between human and not human. Right? Um, so that's where evolution takes hold. Now, around the same time, God leaves the, pig, leaves the stage. You know? I mean, we can point to the death of God as announced by Nietzsche and talk that through, but the simple fact is, prior to 1850, if you want to engage in public discourse, you must frame things as if there's a God in the background, indeed, the Christian God. After 1850, you cannot do so. It's, you make nonsense of yourself. So there's an absolute watershed there. God dies around there, and Darwin delivers the news that we have to find ourselves in the natural world, that we are not and cannot think of ourselves as a distinguished kind. Now, we don't know what to do with that news. That tells us that we are organisms, and to this day, it's very funny. If you read papers throughout cognitive science, all the various approaches, everyone likes to doff their hat at naturalism. Nobody wants to be seen to be making up um, fantasies, Christian fantasies, right? And so they'll talk about the organism, but they don't mean anything by it. So Ray Jackendorf writing about semantic structures refers to the organism because he means the person, but he doesn't want you to understand the person as someone with a soul. He wants to no, we're being naturalistic here, but he's referred to nothing that you can make sense of in terms in organismic senses. And you find that throughout the literature. So when I say um, I have difficulty speaking as an embodied cognitive scientist, it's because the discourse, including the whole of the 4E discourse, doesn't know what to do with the terms organism, animal, person, human, and system. They're all different. You and I are persons. Right? We're having a conversation as persons. Now, we might, for example, begin to discuss the term human and what its bounds are and what it, what it means, what it doesn't mean. But that's not going to destroy us as persons, no matter how insane our beliefs are there. You know, we're... The person is, is, is my minimal basis for having a conversation. Right? The human is a real problem. We'll come back to that. But it's linked to the other two, organism and animal. From Maturana's work, organism means only self-production. Everything else we have to add on. Every, the observer becomes implied. Maturana gives you this little gift as an embodied cognitive scientist, you can acknowledge the existence of other beings who have their own purposes. Um, everything else is, I mean, any other observation is going to be observer dependence. We're going to always, second order cybernetics is very important that you're the one drawing the distinctions. Um, and people do. People try to build from Maturana's minimal insight. Ezekiel Di Paolo is particularly important here adding things like adaptivity and so on to the basic insight, but that's that's exegesis and, and, and you know downstream of the insight of autopoiesis. So here we are. In the incidentally in the Gibsonian literature, you can sensitize your ear to this. If you read those papers, they, they call themselves psychology, they're not psychology in the um, but they, they also they don't speak of the organism. They speak of the animal. And it's a real, once you become sensitive to this, it's a real clangor. Because the animal, you know, they're not obviously making an animal human distinction because they're calling themselves psychology. They're saying, we're about you, you know, and you're an animal. But they've missed out on something because animals, well, we're talking here about how words are used. I'm not going to, I'm not going to define anything. The term animal appears in many contexts and gives rise to many visions. One of well, one important distinction is you can fuck a person, but not an animal. You can kill an animal, but not a person. And with that, we set up industrial scale flesh processing machine. If we knew what went on in intensive farming today, we wouldn't never sleep a wink. The only reason we can sleep is because they're animals. 
So that word is doing an enormous favor to us and shutting us off from the material conditions of our own living. So it's really weird to be addressed as an animal because that animal has traditionally been used to distinguish, make a distinction between the, the beast and the Christian. <laughs> so organism is not much better. And here's where we have to do work. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do.